and we are back. I just watched episode three of season two of Rings of Power. My opinion is similar so far t- uh, to uh, previous episodes. It, um, I think, pacing wise, season two is continues to be an improvement on season one. Uh, lore wise, is still uh, quite shaky. We get a rehash of. Elendil trying to calm down Beric, uh, the almost shot-for-shot remake of Aragorn uh, trying to calm down um, uh, Brego. It, I, we did not really need to have a repeat of this scene. We could have seen like one or two shots of it in the recap, and that would have been enough. Uh, it, we should have started right here, when the horse is just sort of walking through the desolation. That, that should have been the opening of that episode. I, it does not make sense to rehash uh, that scene, especially since it's, it, it just feels like uh, a poor copy of um, the, that scene from the Peter Jackson films. Then some orcs attack the horse. The horse goes into a dark wood that even the orcs are scared about. And then we get spiders. I'm not crazy about the concept of a random spider cave. Because I, I feels like it's implying that this is like young Shelob, which feels weird and wrong for a variety of reasons. But the scene itself, from a structural level, is I think actually quite uh, surprising in its momentum quality. I mean, it, it like the pacing in it is is pretty good, like from a micro perspective, where he you know his horse wakes him up, he's stuck in spider webs. He see, the, the spiders start to attack. He sees a weapon with the with the orc. I like this because the he, he's getting a weapon from the orc, and then the orc comes alive. There's an escalation of tension. He tries to find a solution. It gets worse. Then he fights this 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 orc guy, and there's still spiders. And now there's an orc guy, and there's an, a natural escalation. Now the big spider shows up. You, you see what I'm saying? For just this is this is basic. A narrative competence of like of escalating the tension, escalating the threats. This is this is good from a micro perspective. It's like some an action set piece that works. It doesn't work in the wider frame of the story, though. That's the tragedy of it. <sighs> because it's point it's a pointless scene. He's in a spider cave, he has a fight scene, he gets out of it. We're probably never gonna see the spiders again. Right? It, it doesn't matter in the wider frame of the world, which is tragic because I think the storytelling from a micro perspective works and has tension. It's great. It's a shame that it's being wasted on a scene that doesn't really serve the wider narrative. There, it's, it's, that's just, it's, it's sad because I think the scene itself has, has some great, has some great uh, story beats in it. And I wish that they would take some of those lessons from those story beats and apply them to scenes that, that actually are a part of the story. Right. Uh, so Isildur's sister still thinks he's dead and is, like, on a war path to, uh, screw over the queen, because she blames the queen. The queen has this, there's this funeral for her father, and she gets slapped, which was, that, it's just, it's amazing. <laughs> Great. And then she hugs her, and that's, that's that scene. It's really to show how her strong moral character, and not much else, and that people are upset at her. Um, then she has a scene with the chancellor and, uh, they have the, a clothing talk about the symbolism of the two clothes of, of the colors and that she should wear red for their future instead of white for their past. We don't really know the context for why these colors mean that, but whatever. She wants to wear white to honor her father. And so she does. And we know in this scene, she's trying to hide the fact that she has the bracer of her father and which unlocks the Palantir room. Then there's this scene at the bar with Sealer's friend, and there's like political dissidents, <laughs> political dissidents uh, who are complaining about the queen and how uh, Farazan should the, the chancellor should be in charge. Uh, they they insult the queen in it, and then the Sealer's friend uh, is upset about that because she he saw the queen try to save Sealer. And so she, he makes them shut up, but not really because they go back to talking about it the moment he goes away. And Sealdor's sister, she talk, tells them about the Palantir and um, we discover 
uh, we have this cut to the queen going to the Palantir room, which is one of the few cuts in the story that makes sense narratively. So I'm very happy about that. You know how much I love to talk about the scene transitions. This was a sensible scene transition. So I'm going to point it out. We find out that Sildur's sister has stolen the Palantir. And then we cut to Adar, because that makes sense to cut to. (laughs) We find out that the orcs are concerned about hunting, like going to war again for no reason, but Adar really wants to make sure that Sauron is dead. And then there's a shot of an orc baby. (laughs) People have been fussing about this so much uh, on the internet. And then I finally see this scene, and it's like two seconds long, guys. Uh, I was expecting, like... The, the show to focus on this because with how much how much complaints there were. Uh, I think the show might have a perception about the orcs similar to that of how I commented that their elves feel more like D&D elves. I think their orcs feel more like D&D orcs. They feel like another fantasy people, whereas in Tolkien, they're like, their creation is a tragedy inflicted upon them by an other higher evil entity so this definite i think this portrayal of them less kind of lessens that horror it's a very different portrayal i'm not saying it's 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 kind of whatever it's it's a the orcs are not tolkien orcs at this point because and they're almost it's almost explained why because they're not being controlled by morgoth or sauron of course i think tolkien sauron would not have this inability to... <laughs> Within the context of the story that this show is trying to tell, uh, th- this perception of the orc family unit does not really uh, conflict with what they're tr- doing. Uh, it's not... It certainly conflicts with canon, uh, but they've already broken... With, with the context that Sauron isn't running them and they aren't their will isn't being dominated by a entity right now I I don't know I I guess it I guess it makes sense if they're like more people like I guess I don't know where they're going with this like I think it could go in interesting directions I'm just concerned that this was just kind of a lazy attempt to garner sympathy instead of story beat they intend to return to because when Sauron reclaims the orcs and imposes his will upon them this is going to be lost there is a tragedy to that that they could explore of like the orcs being free and being able to achieve their sense of self from Morgoth and then Sauron takes that from them there is a sorrow and tragedy to that that they could explore um because they've given space for it, since now Sauron isn't controlling them in this timeline. I'm not confident they'd explore that that story with any level of subtlety or depth. So I'm I'm not... I don't think it'll work. It, it's definitely a departure from Tolkien, but I, this is not a surprise. They're, 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 they're written like a misunderstood traditional fantasy race. That's not what the Tolkien orcs were. Um... But whatever. And then there's a troll that comes because he has a grudge on Sauron, I guess. <laughs> so we're going to have a troll fight Sauron. It, this version of, of Sauron, I, I don't know. I mean, Sauron isn't... It, it, it's kind of laughable knowing what one knows about the power that Sauron wields. And, then you, and you're like, oh yes, we're going to pit him against this. A troll. We're gonna pit him up against a troll. That's 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 a good matchup. What? Are we supposed to be like? Oh, I wonder what will happen. It's a troll. This is the same thing that happened with Galadriel in season one. And you're like, a troll is not dangerous to Galadriel, or at least canon Galadriel. And you're like, oh, she she had it. She that's not a problem to her. She didn't even need a sword in canon to defeat a troll. Uh, Sauron certainly doesn't. <laughs> so I it it's silly. Uh, from a canonical perspective but with this version of sauron whatever he he got stabbed by a bunch of orcs he's he gives off he he does he's not very intimidating in this version so i guess this soft soft man whatever
All right, so we cut to the Durin treating with Celebrimbor, because Celebrimbor wants to make him rings in exchange for Mithril. And I think I would enjoy the scene, except, like, the portrayal of Anatar in this scene is so silly. He just drops the ball so hard in convincing Durin. It's it's like, what? <laughs> this is Sauron at his most convincing. I, I don't know. It seemed it seemed silly to to take that from Sauron, seeing as you've you've depowered him in all these other areas. At least let him be a silver tongued bastard, the way he deserves, and do du- be able to have Durin like immediately find him suspicious. It completely negates that. Like you're you're making him too obvious. You're like let him let let him be subtle about it. He, he's so blunt and and. Like an amateur in this scene at Deception. I mean, I could do a better job than this. At least in the next scene with Calibrimor and Anatar, we, we get some of his mojo back, but I'll talk about that in a second. And so Durin immediately suspects that something's not right uh, because he screws up. And then, But Disa's trying to convince him that he should uh, talk to his father about it. And it's so finally the relationship with the father is tying in with the main plot. I like this concept. I do. I do. In concept, I like this. The Durin plot of with his father finally coming into play with the rings and all of that. I think they switched who should be gunning for the elves helping them. Right? Durin has every reason to trust the, the elves compared to his father. Right? He's friends with Elrond. He's the one who tried to help them when the elves were struggling. He's and his father is a, is a suspicious, stubborn bastard. It, it's so obvious that he should be the one that's uncertain about this. But because Durin is the protagonist and the good guy, he has to be the one being like uncertain about it. It, it feels like a, a forced flip, I think, personally. I, I think it's a little unnatural. I know why. It's because, oh, Anatar is untrustworthy. I'm like, the, I think it would have felt more real if her, his father is right to mistrust them, right? And then he's, but but Durin somehow convinces him to talk with the elves, and Anatar works his mojo and on the king, on on Durin's father, and then it, it then it happens, and then Ana, the Anatar allowed it to happen because he's so persuasive. That would have been a show of just how powerful and skilled he is at, at persuasion and manipulation. That would have been a great show of it to make even this stubborn ass man change his mind. It would be an, imp- an impressive feat on Sauron's uh, part, right? It would have been great. But I'm not sure these writers are are confident in their ability to write that. Because they I and I, I doubt their ability to write that because I'm I'm not impressed with the dialogue they have so far necessarily. What I will give now, we do have a little earlier in the episode a an example. of Anatar's shenanigans. And uh, this part I did like, because it shows a skill at manipulating Celebrimbor, which is fun. Um, that's, that's again, that's what I wanted to see. Anatar manipulating Celebrimbor is a, is, is a fun dynamic that I wanted I wanted to see explored. It's, it's all right. It's, it's not great. Uh, manipulation, it's not, it, but it's its serviceable and it's significantly better than the stuff with the dwarves. This feels more subtle and planting the idea in Keller Brimbor's head. It's not his idea, it's Keller Brimbor's idea. That I like. That feels more in keeping with, with the type of deceiver uh, Anatar is implied to be in canon. So I, I enjoyed this scene. And then we get the bodies in the water is clearly, I mean, clearly a reference to the bodies in the water and Lord of the Rings, because of course it is, because they can't go like 10 minutes without referencing the Peter Jackson films or Lord of the Rings in general. It it just makes me sad to stop, stop doing that. Then he goes into this area. Then he gets stabbed by a girl and he is very kindly forgiving about that. This relationship is fine. I don't mind it, it's whatever. Uh, then they ride, and this guy tricks the seal door and steals his horse, and he, then they almost kill him, but then Arondir shows up, and it's, yeah, 
And then we find out, based on this introduction to Rondir, that Bronwyn is dead. I, I don't know how to judge this, because it's clear that the actress just didn't want to come back. I mean, I wish that she had died last season, because that would have been a much stronger death narratively. Her dying off screen to the poison of the thing is it's disappointing. I wish they could have done like some scene where they might not have needed to use the actress of just like a Rondir seeing her body fall or coming too late or something narratively. Just her this off screen thing is very disappointing. I know there's not much they could have done, but it's it it is unfortunate from a writing perspective. We get I'm very disappointed with the direction they decided to play. Uh, a Rondir and Theo's relationship. They're kind of back to square one again, where she, he blame now he blames a Rondir for his mom's death, I, I assume, and they're just back at, to being how they were before. And it feels really like a reset of the of their relationship. Very disapp- I'm very disappointed by it because I think the growth of that was was a character growth for the both of them that I would have loved to see moved in that direction. They have him trying to connect with Theo in a way that he should have done last season. Uh, like, you know, the thing about revenge and all of this, like all the things that Galadriel, for some reason, was was the one to talk to him about last season. We finally get a Rondir doing it, and he just... And Theo is not having it because Theo doesn't... I, I assume this is just a phase that they're going to... They're eventually going <sighs> to reconnect or whatever, but it's... I don't know. I just feel like they're retreading ground a little bit. Fine. At least, at least their relationship, there's something going on in it. So I guess I should be happy about that. We get this random scene. You have to understand that... Okay, so the, the villagers from last season have set up camp in a abandoned colony of Numenor, right? <laughs> because in canon, Numenor has tons of colonies. They're not an isolationist like they are in the, the show. And they're, they're actually quite... Uh, <laughs> I would say imperialistic almost and have lots of things going on and spreading significantly. Uh, but to fit in with their own version of Numenor, they have, this is an abandoned settlement. What I do like about it is that it's by far the best showcasing of the wonder of Numenor. Cause I feel like the scenes of Numenor do not do Numenor <laughs> very much justice. It, Numenor doesn't feel powerful or majestic in their own scenes. Uh, their wide shots look pretty good, but their their set shots in their interiors, there's something off about them. They don't they don't look as grand as you want. The only time the show has really captured a feeling of wonder for this for this civilization, I think, is right here, where Isildur talks about their aqueducts and Theo says that like men can't do that. And in Numenor they can. Right? They're that that Numenor's not even on screen, and that felt like, whoa, wow. Where's that Numenor? I think the introduction to Numenor was weakened in the first season by the fact that the two people that we were, like, narratively with when Numenor was introduced uh, was Galadriel and Sauron. Two people who, like, one of the few people who wouldn't be, like, super hyper-impressed by the technology of Numenor. It, I, you almost wish that there was some character like humble character who doesn't have these grand origins to see Numenor and be like, holy crap, right? That was an advantage of the hobbits in the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings stories, where people from very humble backgrounds seeing the elven Rivendell, Lothlorien, the minds of of various dwarves and feeling that wonder because they they are not used to that. And you don't really get that with Numenor. And I think I think you feel that loss uh it's especially obvious that that was missing when you see Theo's wonder here. That could have really helped the story when Numenor was first introduced. And we get this scene with the sealed door and the girl, I think her name's Astrid. The scene works narratively. I think this is the characters, like we, we learned some stuff about a sealed door and it explained a lot about his character and Theo overhearing it and Theo being very moved by it uh, was, was interesting. Uh, I think there was just a very minor, uh, uh, writing, just a very minor writing issue that I want to point out. When he first talks about how his mother drowned and that it's his fault, there needed to be a reaction shot. Uh, when he says this, Astra doesn't really at first react. She just goes straight into talking about her own uh, struggles. Saving my life. After my mom. It's a very minor thing. 
that there just needed to be a moment of being like, oh my god, because what he said is very vulnerable and 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 extremely shocking. And you just needed to see that shock for just a moment before she moves on to whatever else you want her to say, because I, it, I think it saps some of the power of what he's saying when you don't have characters react to it. She does have a reaction shot, just like one one beat in the in the conversation later. I just think that that reaction shot should have just been one beat earlier. Saving my life. See what I'm saying? I think. It could have just made that scene just a little stronger. D don't talk about your mother. Just let just uh, talk about your mom. Mom, just a second later, let let that reaction shock. And like he reacts, but it, it comes too late to really help the narrative for the audience. I just it it it's just a it's just a subtle thing. It's a subtle thing. All right, and then we find out that she has the mark of Adar. So there's either she swore allegiance to Adar just to survive and then walked off, or she's a spy. Um, but I, I'm not shocked. You kind of, you, know, you could see it coming. Then Theo Isildur try to save Isildur's horse. And while he's doing that, an interesting shot here. This is the most Dunedain Isildur has ever been in this one moment. I don't know. I think I kind of I liked it because it, it, Numenor, like they, they are very, very underplayed how powerful Numenorians are. Numenorians aren't normal humans. This is something that the show has made a, has clearly made a deliberate effort to downplay. They're like, oh no, they're just humans. Then they're not just humans. They're 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 different. Uh, this is the first instance where it, you almost get that feeling of him just almost hiding in plain sight. Just the way that shot is of almost this. It, it almost felt mystical. I liked that. I liked that a lot just because it felt he felt more than a man, and the Numenorians are more than men. Uh, so it was nice. It was nice to see that almost like mystical hiding in plain sight next to the horse. It just I, I I liked it. I liked it. It's a very small thing, but I enjoyed that. All right, and then Theo saves him um, by just kind of showing up and uh, claiming that he wants to work for that he does work for Adar and showing his mark that he got from the the blood sucking sword. Um, what is Theo's plan here? Like I know he's trying to help the sealed door, but. Like his plan is so. Like, what what is the goal here? I do not understand it. it it's not clear at all. I'm sure. I hope that that this is going to be explained. But right now, it just seems like he he suicidally just walked in and was like, "Hey," like on the off chance that people believe he works for Adar. I just, I, it it feels stupid. But I, I mean, he is a, t a dumb teenager. Like, but I, I wish usually dumb teenager plan like have bad plans. Uh, I just wish that we knew what his bad plan was. Because right now it doesn't look like there's any plan. And he gets saved by uh, an axe and runs away. I don't know who threw the axe. It, 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 it's, un again, very unclear. I hope there's there's some clarity on that. And then I s assume the troll shows up and he gets grabbed. That's that's the implication here, but we're not sure. Again, we get a, we get a, a terrible cut. And it goes from... <laughs> it goes from... Uh, Seal door's face to bells ringing. Uh, and then we get to this scene. Oh my gosh. We gotta talk about this scene. The queen walking out. This is, a, this is a flat a flat shot, right? And then then we get, the next shot is of her face. And then we, 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 we get introduced to this grand room from her perspective, which, which is high, the camera is high and looking down, which makes this, the room look ever smaller. And, and the crowd ever smaller. Everything looks small. Every looks contained, almost like a set. It doesn't feel grand. The reason why I bring this up is because while I was watching it, I could not help but make a certain comparison. Landing. Protector of the realm. That came out years ago. This is that is the end of season one of House of the Dragon, right? It is almost, a, it is the same scene. Let us be clear here. It is a scene, it is a coronation scene where someone walks through some weapons, then gets up on a thing, and then gets interrupted by a, by a claimant, a different claimant to the throne, and a winged, dangerous creature shows up at the end. It's the same, it's the same scene. But the lighting and the scale feel like night and day. Why? And I, I wanted to break this down because I couldn't help but notice this. These are two very different shows, but this scene, these two scenes are very similar. And they, they're, 
I think a great almost masterclass in some of the things that, that this, this show doesn't quite get right. Let's start with scale. In House of the Dragon, the scene starts from the perspective of the peasants. From a, from a camera perspective, it starts from the perspective of the people entering this room. It's a swarm of peasants. From their perspective, you enter, and it's a grand, massive room. So the camera is moving up, It's it, everything looks big, everything looks grand. And in the contrast, you're introduced in a flat... This is, this is the first shot of this room. This shot. This shot, what, what, it, it, the room feels tiny. It feels like a set because it is one, but it feels like one. But then you look at the crowd, it keeps going and it, it, the crowd is seen from her perspective, which makes it look smaller. There's also less people. I assume House of Dragons CGI'd a bunch, a huge part of that crowd, but it's not super noticeable. And I don't understand why they couldn't do that as well, considering their budget. There's also, so I think that is one, uh, first of all, the way the camera fails to convey scale, that's the first issue. Number two, lighting. The lighting of House of Dragon almost looks like a Dutch painting. It is like dusty and dark and muted. It works. It has a very clear sense of style. This feels very flat. I'm, I think the lighting really doesn't do these, cam these fabrics justice. Because what I've heard is that some of these costumes are extremely well made in, rea in reality and like spared no expense kind of stuff. But if that's true, you don't really see it. A lot of it feels very flat. And I think that might just come down to the lighting. The lighting is doing them no justice. It looks very like a kid's fantasy movie, TV movie. That, that's, that's kind of the lighting that this is giving. This is giving Narnia. This looks more like Narnia than it does something that costs a billion dollars, right? I don't mean this as an insult to Narnia. I love Narnia, but there, there should be a quality difference. Um, but I, I would say, in some ways, Narnia looks better than this. So then she gets up. She does a speech. Uh, that, like, her emotions are... Three, acting. Just the facial acting of, of certain people. Like, it's just... I mean... I mean, look, look at Aegon's facial acting in that one scene where he goes from uncertain to delight to confidence in just facial acting. That's an enormous scene with almost no dialogue. They're, they have whole speeches that don't, I don't think emotionally resonate quite as well, right? Then she has this speech, she does this thing. So then Isildur's sister reveals the Palantir to everyone and that it's like some elf artifact is, is the real person controlling the country, yada, yada, yada. When she drops the thing, I, why did why did they camera? The cam it's so obvious the camera should follow that orb banging against the the steps, but instead they don't show it, and it just kind of rolls to his feet. It just it doesn't it doesn't flow very well. I don't know. This is just a personal camera work thing. I would have followed that that the palantir down and like let it roll to Elendil's feet and then pan up. I think it's a little weird the way they did it. Whatever. Then she admits that the Palantir is hers, which causes a riot. And then the eagle shows up. <laughs> Again, I, I, I gotta talk about scale, right? When the dragon shows up in House of the Dragon, at the end of that scene, the dragon feels massive and it feels dangerous because there's all these tiny people like right next to it. So the sense of scale is very clear. The, we don't get that with, with this eagle that's away from the crowd at the edge and like at the edge of, at the this window to this bigger room like it, the angle we don't get a wide shot that really shows its scale the wide shot that we do get is from the outside and i think that's a mis it just it the the scale of look at that the, the 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 choice to put it like that makes the guy seem almost the same height as the eagle we know it's not but that but because that is always how they're doing it the eagle's sense of grandeur is a little shrunk I, I, I think you could have done, it, it could have worked a little better. Then we get to where people start chanting that fair is on, that the eagle is for fair is on. I, I, again, I have to compare it to House of the Dragon because Aegon does the same thing and it, it just, it reads better. I, I, I don't want to compare it to these two shows because they're very different shows, but the scenes, these singular scenes are very similar. They, they, they're they almost the same scene to the point where I'd argue, and in some ways, how this show copied it. 
the comparison just almost clarifies some of these issues. The, it, it doesn't quite gel. It's the, the, the funny thing is this scene's not terrible. It's just that rem remembering House of the Dragon scene and then seeing this scene side by side there just shows some of the filmmaking just basic filmmaking things that could have tightened this, this up, could have made this work. Like all of these little things pile up and make it not resonate. It's 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 not none of these these one things I'm pointing to are catastrophic. They're all small errors that compound upon itself. That when you take a step back, it it loses the audience in the narrative. You don't get pumped. You don't get horrified. You don't this. My one thing I can say to this is I was happy that the eagle was like the. Eagle showing up ended up being good for Farazhan because I was for a second worried that the eagle was going to bail uh, Muriel out, uh, just like the tree like leaves falling ba bailed Galadriel out back in season one, and I was about to be very pissed about. It. I was about to be very annoyed by that. I am delighted that it ended up helping Farazhan just because that'll move the plot in uh, hopefully a more interesting direction. Uh, just because that. That doesn't. That feels less like being bailed out by God. So that's nice. Then we get to the uh, dwarves forging the rings, uh, and Anatar touching Mithril clearly, uh, fiddling with the rings. Um, and then we cut to black. Uh, whatever. I my opinion is similar to what it was. Uh, last episode, I think just from a, f a story flow, it does flow better. I think Isildur's story in particular, narratively, it felt like an episode. Like there's there's ups and downs, and there was direction, and there was flow. I like that. Um, uh, overall, there's still some there's still some issues. Um, it is funny that the the fact that Elendil still doesn't know Elendil and his sister still doesn't know he's alive. And because they're now on like two ac across the sea away from each other, they're just going to milk that for the entire season. And I'm not excited about that just because we've already been there. It, it's just, it's just going to run its course. And it feels like it's, it's, it's a plot point that's overstaying. It's welcome a little bit, but whatever. But the story's pacing is better than season one. I stand by that. So there's that, I guess. I mean, at least there's things happening so there's like interest in seeing the next episode of like what's this gonna happen with how are they gonna i guess i guess i'll see you on the next one i guess